Welcome all once again. It is 1.30 a.m. our normal time to cover a lot of the data surrounding the pandemic as well as certain policy measures. It is June 27, 2021 and welcome all friends, especially those of the data mindset, data analysts, scientists, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, so on and so forth down the line. Of course, anyone whom else is interested in looking at the pandemic and policy measures in a different light. With that in mind, let us proceed with the fact checking per se to make it easier for our fact checkers. To begin with, our sources are as follows. VAERS Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, courtesy CDC, courtesy, I believe, Oxford University, as well as others, Our World and Data, one of Incredible sources of reference for pandemic data sets all across the board, as well as other data, as you can go down the line here and follow. And of course, a new up and comer, Outbreak Info, an incredible, incredible site as far as checking the variants in a multitude of different locations, so on and so forth, as far as variants of concern and variants of interest, which is quite commonly utilized in the media, sometimes utilized incorrectly, but still just the same a wonderful site, Outbreak Info. The articles that we'll be covering tonight are as follows. Uh, do not get the title, be mis, uh, misread the title, Attention Anti-Vaccinators, Skin Reactions to mRNA COVID-19 Vaccines and No Cause for Alarm. It is not all it covers. And again, we discussed this before during the dark ages, the, we, uh, the greater minds back then used to speak in something called circumlocutions. Circumlocutions is when they tried to get information out, but they spoke indirectly or kind of cryptic. But however, though, here we are again, 2021, uh, for everything from pandemic lockdowns and so on and so forth is so, so reminiscent of the dark ages. Circumlocutions. Next, a tapeworm drug against SARS-CoV-2. Again, this is an interesting title. However, though, there's something covered in this article, especially called spermidine, which is obviously a fairly common supplement. So we'll cover the outcome in reference to the research on that a little bit. Number two, uh, shadow banks have exploded the COVID-19 crisis. That's a real blast for an article. Economics are as much to do with health as anything else. And we're just going to cover this briefly, but it's information that you should know. Tree pollen carries SARS-CoV-2 particles. Uh, puts a, a monkey wrench, so to say, into the social distancing, um, how to describe it, measures, and it has to be re-looked at. And I'll show you some creepy videos in reference to a creepy video. We'll just stick with one due to time constraints. In reference to tree pollen spreading SARS-CoV-2 amongst the crowd. All right, and then we have long COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, interesting in reference to Activation of Epstein-Barr virus, something, again, that we can't really do anything here in reference to, but still it's information that is important because by treating Epstein-Barr, according to what the researchers allude to, you may be able to treat long COVID symptoms. Next, vaccine efficacy. Once again, sounds like a very positive title. Had COVID-19, one vaccine dose, enough boosters for all. Boosters for all focus on that. Once again, the terminology is circumlocution. And yeah, you know where it's going to head pretty fast when they're saying boosters for all right off the bat. And then a real, two articles that came out uh, in the Annals of Neurology, separate articles, separate research articles that you think would be obviously um, newsworthy, but somehow went under the radar. In reference to Jean Bure, obviously I, I want to say Guillain Barr, but uh, how would you say Guillain Barre? Guillain Barre, not Jean Bure. Guillain Barre. Well, it's one thirty-four a.m. I could speak how I like. Guillain Barre syndrome. Uh, it's popping up again, and this is in multiple studies. And this uh, is quite reminiscent of the swine flu vaccine back in the late seventies. Again. Uh, history repeats, hopefully not hard. And we'll go through these two articles as well. And what is this one? This one is, uh, we'll 
we'll go back to this one in a second, whatever it was. Uh, oh, yeah, the antibody response is interesting. Uh, that goes hand in hand with um, this article right here, which I'll have the link for. Probably won't have time to cover tonight, but it still it is very it elucidates quite a bit in reference to the effectiveness of the vaccine after a certain period of time. All right, and then, of course, let's start with the first one. Thrombocytopenia reactions by age. I'll show you a data page right off the bat. All right. What we had to do here is the data is for the fact checkers. These are all data frames that we merged together. I don't want to bore you with the process of how it's done. Uh, but obviously what we have here is the average age right there. If you remember the box plot there. So most of our results are there and obviously no outliers. But what we're doing here is this is this is the average age of the reactions of thrombocytopenia. The reason that's important is as follows. The first research article uh, that we're gonna look at is right here. Attention anti-vaccinators, skin reactions, blah, blah, blah. All right, now as we go down the article, all right, the CDC VARES currently, the same VARES that you and I use, the CDC VARES currently lists 260 reports of immune thrombocytopenia, ITP, a disorder characterized by excessive bruising, bleeding, caused by lower plate levels. Case reports suggest it may present differently and occur in varying patient populations, some studies. Again, it's important to read these articles because obviously, you know, we're normally, when we're taught in school, topic sentence, da 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 da, da. well, the topics tend to veer from course quite often in reference to uh, scientific literature or views of literature. So yeah, so obviously we, we it's titled skin reactions, but we're talking about thrombocytopenia. And so you see 260 reports. Now there's a, there's a, a caveat in reference to the VAERS data set. You're looking at 250 megabytes right now, 38 megabytes are just the symptoms alone. Certain individuals uh, have so many symptoms that they basically require more than one report. In fact, give an example. If we look at here, you see a uh, VARES ID 1400623. That's one person. Now, one person, for example, fills out all his reports. Now, we have a natural instinct, for example, to basically just, we're trying to count the number of people reacting. So we see 1400623 will will delete it and have it only show up one time. And therefore then all these other reactions and symptoms are not found. So what I noticed in there is the, the date of their research, uh, which was on, which at least the data was released, was June 22nd, 2021. Who knows when they actually completed the research and then send it out for publication. But you notice they have 260 reports. Well, the problem is I was only showing the 180. So what I had to do is reestablish a database to include all of these. And just for verification, this poor, poor individual, uh, they did live, but just to verify too, and this is for the fact checkers, we go to the data set from the CDC, you see Ver the VARES ID. So what happens is the report could only fit five columns of symptoms. So this one individual, for example, had to fill out 22 separate reports so they can get symptom one, symptom two, symptom three, four, five. So you see the pro you see the uh, the confounding factor. So when you think you're eliminating duplicates, you're also eliminating all the other tail end um, symptoms, which can skew and basically mask uh, certain potential outcomes, which are not maybe to be favorable. So this is one individual and this is all of the symptoms recorded in their vaccine adverse event reporting system. That's number one overall. And obviously this person went through a tremendous amount of trauma as you begin to read throughout the, uh, the entire thing here. But that's just to give you an idea reason why we had to redo the report. So as we do the report, we're gonna go into some interesting uh, reactions to some of the uh, vaccine, the vaccine adverse event reports. Again, they all have to be validated. But however, though, when they had 260, when they issued their report, I am now showing, for example, thrombocytopenia. This would be for data analysts out there to understand this. Now 514. 
with an average age of about 62. And you can see the age breakdown here in reference to thrombocytopenia reactions, at least the vaccine adverse event reportings. They often validated. But now let's get right into the research as follows. So you're going to see some data change a little bit if you've been following it than we did the prior prior times. But da 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 da. Let's let us begin. All right. So we cover this article. Boom. Let's we're done with this one. Oh, by the way, too. Not just that, the 260 reports of immune throttle cytopenia. But this is just food for thought, not to scare people, but I did not realize the development of uncommon reactions such as herpes zoster in reference to the vaccine. So this came out later on. So what I'll do is I'll also hunt for how many people are having herpes zoster reactions to the vaccine. Uh, you know, the word uncommon and rare can be uh, open to debate and interpretation. But I knew about dermal, dermal fillers and ITP, but I was not aware of herpes zoster. And they're serious in nature and justified clinical monitoring. You're going to read that all over the place. For example, the authors observed that most studies in the various data do not include incident rates among all vaccinated individuals because you know the various system only deals with anywhere between 1% to 2% of actually all reactions. Uh, according to current data. Now we have so many reports, it's it's out the window. Out the window. If you read the lead part of this article, you'll see exactly how many vaccine adverse reaction reports we have so far, which is just enormous amount. There's, I find it difficult to believe that anybody can investigate all those in a timely manner. All right, next one. There we go. Boom, boom, boom. Positive stuff. A tapeworm drug against SARS-CoV-2. That's only, we'll cover the tapeworm drug. But, this part is cool, right? It has nothing to do with the tapeworm drug, all right? You'll see in a second. Here we go. When results from studies suggested that the recycling mechanism might be a potential target for COVID-19, bear with me, we're going someplace with this, the researchers tested whether substances which include cellular recycling, keep that in mind, also reduce the replication of SARS-CoV-2 inside infected cells. Interestingly, the researchers found four substances which proved effective. All of them already in use in humans, i.e. people. These include, ready for this one, polyamine, spermidine, autophagy, autophagy, oh, I, I can't pronounce it right now, 142. I want to say autophagy, enhancing metabolite, which is produced in all human cells and bacteria in the human gut. It occurs naturally in foods such as wheat germ, soya, mushrooms, and mature cheese, and is freely available as a food supplement. Yes, you read that right. Freely available as a food supplement. Spermidine. I guarantee you punch it in. You punch in shopping. You'll get some, uh, you'll be enlightened. Uh, again, it's not being marketed for this, obviously, for various reasons. But however, though, the outcome in reference to this research, as we shall proceed. When the researchers added spermidine to cells infected with SARS-CoV-2, remember this is in vitro, not in vivo, not in people as of yet, but in a little petri dish, a 85% reduction in the number of virus particles produced through cellular recycling, wherever that is, right there. Similar results were produced by spermine, another polyamine, which also occurs naturally in the body. Their derivative of spermidine was found to reduce viral replication by more than 90% in human lung cells and in the human gut model comprising clusters of cells known as organoids. That is powerful. And I am going to reiterate, reduced viral replication by more than 90% in human lung cells and the human gut model. It's important because a certain variants and whatever the future may hold comes around, at least in reference to coronaviruses, this is pretty interesting. And also keep in mind too, as another note, emergency use authorizations in reference to experimental vaccines can only be utilized if there are no alternative valid treatments. Just food for thought. And obviously a food supplement as well. Many, that just worked out perfectly. Many questions 
therefore remain to be answered before we can consider the polyamines as a potential treatment against COVID-19. When used in the body, will it be possible to achieve blood levels high enough to inhibit viral replication in the respiratory tract? And if yes, would administration before or during the infection be advisable? All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, ironically, how we write science articles, the, the topic sentence doesn't necessarily have much to do with the body of the research article itself. English teachers will be rolling over, but here we go. The most pronounced antiviral effect was associated with niclosamide, not to be confused with nicotinamide riboside. Uh, niclosamide, when the, which the researchers have shown to be effective against the MERS coronavirus during an earlier study. The tapeworm drug kind of reminds you of ivermectin too, doesn't it? Uh, they have ivermectin for rural blindness, but this is a different one. The tapeworm drug was found to reduce the production of infectious SARS UV-2 particles by more than 99%. So here we have, we have, we have spermine at basically 90%. We have, sperm, um, again, in vitro. And we have niclosamide, which obviously probably not as available as this food supplement, but still just the same. Reduced uh, infectious SARS-CoV-2 particles, COV-2 particles by more than 99%. Pretty fascinating, pretty positive, and hopefully, uh, again, the research was done in individuals and the outcome comes out as promising as we had in this small pilot study. All right, now to the next one. Economics, just as important as to health as anything else. And I'm going to go through this briefly. You ready? Here we go. How shadow banks have exploited the COVID-19 crisis. Rather than leveling it Inequality, as the Great Depression did, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities around the world, allowing some wealthy investors to benefit from the crisis and make a fortune on the misfortune of others. You're ready for this? And this kind of bugs me because you have all these billionaires out there that, that try to pretend to be hip and they're with you or whatever it is, trying to be like one of the crowd. In reality, all they are just an individual attached to a routing number, which has a lot of other numbers behind it. That's it. But here we go. During March and December, this is disgusting. This is still disgusting, though. During the March and December last year, U.S. billionaires increased to wealth by over a th one third. March to December, during the heat of the pandemic, whether you believe in COVID or not, regardless with the lockdowns and the mental strife and just tremendous amount of collateral damage in reference to this pandemic. Certain individuals did very, very well for themselves in a very brief, short of period of time by increasing their, their basically exorbitant wealth by even more exorbitantly by one third. And ironically, if you go to read the study, they do give you the names of certain individuals they'll allude to, but however, just the same, uh, it is really, it's the shadow banks, uh, private equity firms, which are have a little bit, again, I said uh, capital flows make us a more complex opaque, less regulated substances of uh, subsectors, I'll say substances. Um, and it shows you exactly how they were able to capitalize the pandemic and the pandemic, for example, and the lockdowns, the strategies, uh, there could have been a little bit of, um, how I would describe it, confounding in the reasons to why the crisis continued so long, especially since the a lot of the equity firms uh, tended to, uh, it, well, put it this way, the pandemic or what they invested in reference to the pandemic benefited some individuals extremely. Obviously, again, benefited them by increasing their wealth in a few months by one third. It's just food for thought. The links will be there as well. And uh, just read through it on your own. And it's, it's quite enlightening. Next, kind of creepy video. Who would have known? I didn't know. Tree pollen carries SARS-CoV-2 particles farther, facilitates virus spread. This kind of puts a monkey wrench in reference to social distancing and so on and so forth, how it has to be revisited. Because obviously, if pollen is 
a primary vector in reference to a virus uh, spreading. Uh, that's going to change things quite a bit. And it goes into the detail as far as, uh, to our knowledge, this is the first time we show that through modeling and simulation, how airborne pollen microorganisms are transported in a light breeze, contributing to airborne virus transmission in crowds outdoors. And as you go through the article, and there's other things too, temperature, wind speed, and humidity, uh, it could pass, the pollen could pass through a crowd in less than one minute which could significantly affect the viral load, or virus load carrying, uh, carried along and increases the risk of infection. Again, and what they did was, uh, I lost the, the mapping here as far as the, uh, the highlights we did in the paragraphs, but they found the areas where uh, the most pollen correlated very strongly with the areas which had the greatest uh, COVID-19 infection rates. See, for example, the researchers notice a correlation between COVID-19 infection rates and the pollen concentration. So that's something intriguing. And if you go to the, the true research itself, let's reload this. Um, it's really, really, uh, let's see if we can go right here. Wow, that's super low. How about this? That's still, but you can get an idea. You see the, the pollen concentrations, uh, that's white willow pollen uh, as far as that's concerned. This is going to be in 4K, so I hope you can see this clearly. And you see how the corona infection rates per capita uh, tend to mimic each area, except for this area, which is the willow oak pollen. And this is a uh, white willow pollen, I guess. I don't know how they have it like that. But correlation is not necessarily causation, but still just the same. You get the picture. And if you follow their articles per se, whoops, that this one. It, you get an idea on basically how the virus spreads. Let's see, they have a little higher resolution um, video here. You go through all the math, da 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 da. Let's see if it shows up here. Yeah, this is a creepy video. This gives you an idea of how it spreads. You see? Yeah, you get an idea. I mean, you're not going to look at <laughs> a lot of us aren't going to be looking at white willow trees the same, especially during a pandemic anytime soon. But again, the link will be to the research as follows. And who would have known? I mean, I did not know that pollen like this could be a vector for viruses. And it's good information to know in the future. Next, important article long COVID symptoms likely caused by Epstein Barr virus reaction, reactivation. This is important. Because the authors of the study allude to that if you treat Epstein-Barr, potentially you could help uh, mitigate the effects of long COVID symptoms. To proceed as follows. Quote, we ran EBV Epstein, did I say Epstein? Epstein-Barr, please forgive me. When we ran EBV antibody tests and recovered COVID-19 patients comparing Epstein-Barr virus reactivation of those with long COVID symptoms to those without long COVID symptoms. The majority of those with long COVID symptoms, symptoms were positive for EBV reactivation, yet only 10% of controls indicated reactivation. The researchers indicated that it may be prudent to test patients newly positive for COVID-19 for evidence of EBV reactivation, indicated by positive da 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 if patients show signs of EBV reactivation, they can be treated early to reduce the intensity and duration of EBV replication, which may help inhibit the development of long COVID. Hope this information finds the right medical practitioners because this can actually uh, save a lot of people a lot of misery if the uh, hypothesis uh, correlated by the researchers obviously has weight that can do a lot of good for a lot of people so i hope this finds the right individuals all right there we go had covid 19 one vaccine dose enough boosters for all are you ready for this here we go another hit in reference to the vaccines itself this is what they did they look at the study and they looked at antibody tests now keep in mind too there's t cells and things like that and they found that with natural immunity we discussed we uh we reviewed earlier. So a lot of individuals which had natural exposures had uh, really good resistance 
Uh, now we have to see if that's the same with the vaccines. But in reference to the antibodies, here we go. In contrast, those participants who have had COVID-19 prior to vaccination, the first dose produced a vigorous antibody response similar to a severe natural infection. So people that already had COVID, uh, you know, the two vaccine thing, uh, wasn't as required. What they're alluding to here is one vaccine was enough uh, to, uh, to basically respond in a similar way to a severe natural infection. But the second dose provided no additional increase in antibody levels. Important, because when you deal with an experimental vaccine, obviously the less risk you can expose yourself to, probably the better. So if uh, medical authorities per se, or the public per se, or other medical information or news channels, whatever it is, find it in their best interest in order to uh, allude to maybe two vaccine shots and not going to be any necessarily better than one, that could be pretty, that could reduce the opportunity for risk of reactions, especially since a lot of individuals tend to have pretty bad reactions by the second time and not so much in the first one, but to proceed. After the second dose vaccine, you ready for this? And this may be what's going on in Israel because Israel had an incredibly great vaccine campaign uh, early on. And it's been a little bit past three months. And what's that mean? Let us proceed. After the second dose vaccine, after the second vaccine dose, antibody levels waned in both groups comparably to natural infection, resulting in an average loss of 90% within 85 days, 90% within 85 days on the antibody protection. Now, again, they also mentioned the T cell responses, research on T cell responses in reference to the vaccines needs to be done. And I hope they're doing it and not just riding easy because they already got EULA emergency use authorization approval because that's not cool. But and it turns out, it's, well, I'm reading most of the vaccine information out there. I'm not seeing much vaccine research being done by the vaccine manufacturers. Most of the post-marketing analysis is being done by independent researchers, as the case point here for the American Chemical Society. Boosters for all. Well, 90% reduction in uh, nat uh, antibody levels after 85 days. Well, let's look at that real fast. You ready? Da -da 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 -da. Right here. And there's Israel. And of course, Israel started kicking masks in. But remember here is that they had an incredibly successful vaccination campaign. And here they are, obviously a little bit beyond three months later on. And this is the different variants which are beginning to rise. So we'll, we'll see. The problem is, for whatever reason, the last time they reported any data was May 29th. So it's... June 27th, so we'll see about the updates. But let's get right into the, let's finish up the data. All right, let's see, Guillain-Barre syndrome, not Guillain-Barre, that's what I want to say, Guillain-Barre syndrome. All right, this is a different vaccine. Now, obviously what we had is we two, two articles on the Annals of Neurology. All right, one, utilized the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. The other one used that one. All right, so let's start, start with the abstract first. Quoting, we observed seven cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome that occurred within two weeks after the first dose of vaccination. All seven patients developed severe GBS. The frequency of GBS was 1.4 to 10 fold higher than that than that expected in this period for a population of this magnitude. As six out of the seven patients progressed to arflexic quadriplegia and required mechanical ventilatory support. All right, we're gonna go into the, uh, when we look at the database in a second, we're gonna look at paralysis. Uh, because the Guillaume Barre uh, is not popping up when you try to look, for, search that through the database itself. But how our paralysis is, quoting, now here, now this is important. Ready? Here we go. 
In India, over 104 million doses of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine have been administered. How many people do you think that is? How, what percentage of the population? All right. Have been administered and 13.5 million people have been fully vaccinated. 1% of the population. Now, you know, I often say correlation uh, in reference to the ebbs and the flows of the coronavirus. And you remember how India was going out of control a little while ago? Uh, you know, with all the media saying this and that and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, sensationalizing, unfortunately, the event. Now, keep in mind, only 1% of the population has been vaccinated. And so if we go to, let's say here, India, cases per million. So as you have to ask yourself the question, if 1% of the population has been vaccinated, and yet you have this precipitous drop as follows, and testing is still up there, so keep that in mind. And you have this precipitous drop as well as mortality. How much of a role does basically the lockdowns or generally the vaccines actually play if only 1% of the population has been vaccinated? I know people hear a lot about vaccines, but look how quickly this drops. Now look at the rest of Asia, we're going to see about the exact same algorithmic pattern. Uh, across with other countries as well. And of course, if you want to keep on clicking your feet and tell the world during, when it's raining that clicking your feet will stop it from raining and eventually stops raining, and you're trying to correlate clicking your feet with the rain stopping, well, you get the picture. Medical uh, strategies and policy decisions without having an adequate control is nothing more than superfluous superstition. All right, let's finish up our articles as follows. Here we go. And so once again, we had uh, the AstraZeneca uh, basically as well. And they give some interesting reasons for that uh, per se. I don't know if they had it here or not, but they're discussing potentially an issue with the spike protein for certain individuals. I don't have necessarily in this article here. Let's see real fast. Um, yeah, induced immune thrombotic. Here we go. Thrombocytopenia. Here we go. Uh, have any support at the date? One case of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome has been reported after Pfizer's BNT162B1 vaccination in the U.S. Uh, probably more than one case. Uh, here we report seven patients who developed uh, GBS in a very proximate temporal relationship after the first dose of that particular one that they use over there. And uh, you, you'll get an idea uh, of possibly what's going on. And they're also asking physicians to start looking um, in reference to what may be happening. And it gives a pretty interesting, again, uh, hypothesis into the possible reason uh, GBS is beginning to resurface again, and also the time it takes to from shot to resurfacing. Um, yeah, and it's saying we suggest vigilance for cases of bifacial weakness uh, with paresthesias variant GBS following vaccination. That post vaccination surveillance programs ensure robust data capture of this outcome to assess the quality. Again, new, brand new. Um, I don't want to add more to it than is already out there. So let us get right into the data as follows. This is the one here. Yeah, that's the, that's the long COVID-19. All right, let's begin. All right, so here we go. Let's get into the data. Let's start off right off with the vaccine information. All right, this is quite enlightening. So we're searching for thrombocytopenia reactions by age. And of course, we our data frame ended up being 514. The one that the, we just discussed early in the beginning was 280. So that should give you an idea of the velocity of the increases with thrombocytopenia. All right, so let's go down. Now, what I looked at, you see that right there? Guillain-Barre. Now, what we're looking at is paralysis because you're not going to find it really under the, because um, they're, not, they're not looking for it per se. So even though you see Guillain-Barre, you'll see that, remember, associated with uh, Guillain-Barre, 
but you're not seeing that. So when you when you search it, nothing's going to pop up. Uh, but if you search paralysis, here we go. Are you ready? All right, thrombocytopenia, and then paralysis. Average age, we're looking at, remember this is a box plot, so 50% of our value is going to fall into there. And look at the ages now. The paralysis is kicking in in reference to the frequency. And so, yeah, that's probably right now most individuals which are having reported vaccine adverse event reports becoming paralyzed. Uh, thrombocytopenia, again, these are vaccine event reports that need to be validated to make sure there's nothing, no other confounding factors. So, yeah, so we have, now here's the catch also, too. You'll hear it often reported that one reaction here may be rare and the other reaction may be rare. But however, they'll begin to add up and take them out of their compartmentalized, uh, you know, narrow diagnosis. And you start looking at everything that's occurring, provided it's validated. You start painting a different picture on the likelihood of a reaction being severe. All right, so here we go. Thrombocytopenia, paralysis by age. All right, now. We hear about children. Now check this out. Look at the average age. You see them right there? Average age, average age. Here we go down. Boom, 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 boom. Watch this. Myocarditis. Remember? Look at, you see the age thing? Look at that. Now that is freaky. Myocarditis reaction by age. Both, now keep in mind too, you, you're talking a lesser population that may have been vaccinated later on. But why, why is, are these vaccines purportedly showing up reactions, especially myocarditis, so blatantly in the open uh, in reference to younger individuals? So, I mean, it's not even within the normal spectrum of who's reacting to the, having reactions to the vaccines. So, boom, right there is just, is just befuddling. But I wanted to show you that right off the bat. Let's continue with the rest of the vaccine information. Here we are removing the duplicates. So we just get a, a total number of the reactions and not mistakenly look at these duplicates and then uh, saying, you know, count them as different reports. Here's that one poor individual again, uh, ID number 1400623, which just had a horrendous time. Um, Value count, adults, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. You're interested in this. What's this one, though? Uh, oh, ITP. Yeah, so basically, this is the ITP reactions. So the ITP is, the people are trying to say that, well, they had to have ITP prior, uh, which is the thrombocytopenia, in order for a thrombocytopenia to be re-triggered. And no, that's not the case. If you read through these, no, 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 no. A lot of individuals had thrombocytopenia. They never had, well, never had ITP prior. And you can read their symptoms and how things came on. All right, here we go. Vaccine reactions reports between January to the June 18, 2021. Uh, again, here's your other vaccines. And obviously they're dwarfed compared to the current vaccines on the market. Uh, Yes, there's actually, there are people reacting to these vaccines, but not anywhere near on the scale of the, of the current emergency use authorization of these vaccines. And you can read through here and you can see the reports and so on and so forth. COVID vaccine reaction by age. Yep, that's, that's those, are, those are there. And you're talking 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. You know, it's got a pretty... Interesting bell curve there. So that's it. COVID, COVID, I did this last week. COVID vaccine death reports by age. We are now looking at 4,772 uh, alleged vaccine adverse reports. And that's just the data. Again, a lot of people go, oh, you're fear mongering or whatever it is. N no, and not. That's the that's the vaccine adverse event reports. That's what it is. And again, for anybody to say that the vaccines are perfectly safe or 100% safe, um, it may not be studied, uh, may not be looking at the actual reports themselves. So again, 
So once people are vaccinated, it's they're kind of on autopilot, uh, unless they have a reaction per se. COVID, COVID vaccine reaction reports by days of the week, then it does, so on and so forth. Less people are getting vaccinated, so obviously it went down. That's the meme. Uh, the rolling seven-day average, get an idea there. All right, now looking at, see, these are the individuals that have five or more symptoms. So these are people that are filling out duplicate reports. So people can get, they get at, if they don't do the data right, it can make it look like even much larger than it actually is. So you have 135,300 duplicate reports. Uh, these are the deaths of myocarditis, which are basically listed so far in the vaccine adverse event report reactions. These are the ages. You can read, um, again, these, these are horrible. And they're, they're fast. So, you know, these are the onset dates. They're pretty, they're pretty similar across the board. Uh, you know, you could read on in your own. Um, myocarditis again, all the way down the line. Here we are as far as our guidepost information. Reported vaccine reactions of all 2020 versus up to June 18, 2021, which was our database. I guess if you want to look at the database, you look at the data here and you could see the date right there, June 18th, 2021. And so look at that. And we're at 376,296 reactions up to that point in time. Individual, not reports, individual reactions. There are more reports, but that's again, one person will fill out multiple reports uh, versus 57,115 for all of 2020. And these are short-term reactions. So I want you to keep that in mind that this number may end up growing uh, exponentially uh, as time moves forward. Again, if there's alternative treatments out there that could be just as effective as the vaccine, then emergency use authorization should be questioned. Uh, and turning a blind eye to potentially other viable treatments being produced and researched by credible medical institutions is not an excuse to maintain emergency use authorization. And all I'm doing is just doing this. I'm trying to basically look at a risk benefit analysis. If there are other substances out there which has less risk but greater benefit, then don't fault me for questioning emergency use vaccination uh, vaccination uh, authority. Uh, all, uh, ignorance is not any justification for bad policy measures or forcing people to take a medical treatment um, that may have a greater risk than benefit just for virtue signaling. Virtue signaling really, really is irritating. We're all guilty of it, including myself, but right now it's it's over it's a little overboard. All right, let's consider let's go forward with this so describing your data. Uh, all right, this is individuals that died uh, that are under the age of twenty two. As you can read down here as far as what they've had, the dates when the reports have been filed like June 9, 2021, the type, uh, what happened to them. You can, you know, again, I, I encourage you not to trust me, but to become curious and look into the information yourself. And as we go down here, this is, a, this is the full text of many of these symptoms. You can just read on and on and on. They're just very detailed and they're, they're, they're heartbreaking. I mean, so let's keep on going. And this is not just headaches and fatigue. These, these, and, and this is just this is just a random, a random pick. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, headaches and fatigue may be part of the symptoms, but as we proceed forward, you'll see more in a second. All right, here we go. Da 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 da. da. All right, what happened here? Uh, do, 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 do. All right, I see what happened here. One second. All right, what we're going to do is I'm going to fix this real fast. And then I'm going to rerun this report. And then we are going to come back to, but we are going to go to another report real fast. If you notice what I'm doing here is I'm fixing the data frame. All right, kernel, restart. Let's see, I will restart and run all cells and we'll come back in a second to this. All right, just for the expediency, let's go into our variants and I'll come back to that. 
All right, this is the variance. This is from outbreakinfo.com. All right, so here we are. The variant right now, B17 and B176172. Uh, that's the United States. Yeah, you notice you notice this. The blue is new vaccination smooth per million. All right, just again, correlation is not necessarily causative, but however though, let's just let's see. All right, the vaccine variant B16172. Uh, we're looking at basically that's a concern. I should move that a little bit to the side. And yeah, you notice that. And then obviously this declines, it all begins to decline. So uh, again, I'm looking for viral pathogen replacement or vaccine derived uh, pathogen uh, per se. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. Uh, here we are in England, vaccine smooth per million. Um, again, nothing here correlating visually, but you can see, now keep in mind, these are always going to be at a, one is just a hundred percent. So you have two people infected and you can have 50, 50 percent and make it sound like huge numbers. But however, though, it's just proportional. And as we go down here is Israel. Israel is suspect to me because I haven't seen any new data since, again, we showed before, since May 29th. And there's a heat maps to do nothing of information right now. Right there, there's a variance in the United States. It gets always a little wonky towards the end of the data frame because of mixed data. Uh, with certain time frames uh, fall different things. Let's see if we got the information all set here. Hang on a second. Uh, my card is. Let's see if we have our information updated yet. Here we go. All right. Let's see. Da, da, da. Wow, it's a lot of stuff. Did we fix the flaw? Yes, we did. All right, here we go. All right, let's finish up this, this report on this data frame right here. This is the vaccine adverse event reports. All right, most common vaccine reactions, looking at a word cloud. Let's make this a little smaller. All right, so let's see what we got here. It's just so we fit it all there. There we go. So this is the most common reactions. Visually, it's a really good brief way of looking at it. These are what people are feeling uh, when they do fill out a report. So fatigue and headache, obviously, is your number one. Abdominal pain, body temperature, pain, pain, uh, back pain. You, you get the idea. Now, top 30 reported symptoms right across here. Obviously, headaches, number one, fatigue, chills, dizziness, injection site pain, and so on down the line. The symptoms are different for younger individuals. The symptoms are different for minors. But let's proceed forward. These are the symptoms from people that have succumbed allegedly to the vaccine. So these are the vaccine adverse event reports where people have potentially died of a vaccine reaction. It has to be validated. Yeah, you see a lot of things which are quite interesting there. Cardiac arrest seems to be huge. Let's look at the bar chart. Obviously death, if they died, death would be number one. Uh, but here is basically um, reactions which obviously resulted in individuals uh, bad outcome. COVID-19 pneumonia, COVID-19. Uh, again, these are these are elements which I know the vaccine itself can't cause it, but could it be something that could it be infected with COVID-19 and then they get vaccinated and didn't pop up on a test or whatever it is. And you, you I don't know. It's all conjecture, publisher bias, but you get the idea. Um, now go reactions by age. Now we look for the, the most vulnerable aspect of our society. And this is important to all of us, at least especially to me, because I worry about it a lot. Uh, COVID vaccine reaction reports by age and minors. Uh, this is the age group most affected. Uh, this is the, uh, obviously you see in the reports begin to go up uh, every day. But again, we've really been pushing to vaccinate a lot of the kids. And as we proceed forward, Again, in the middle of nowhere, these are lot numbers with the greatest number of reactions. Let's proceed forward. I'll, I'll leave this frozen for a second. There's that if you want to freeze the screen. All right. And then basically, this is the most number one reactions in children. Can you see right off the bat, the number one reaction uh, being reported in individuals under the age of 19, not 19 or 
are younger, under 19, so 18 and younger, I should say. And you could see how the vaccine, for whatever reason, uh, the reports at least indicate uh, a greater, um, you know, cause of concern. Where fatigue and headache, you would think would be number one in adults, uh, this is occurring most often in developing bodies. Here is the top 30 reported symptoms in minors, headache, dizziness, fatigue, hyperhidrosis, chest pain. And as it goes down the line like this, it's something important to know, um, you know, cough is like down here compared to chest pain being up here. Normally you think a cough would be in the top five as opposed to chest pain. All right, do you see what I mean? Let's proceed down the line. Did I do anything else here? Uh, the reports are now going up in ratio to the vaccines being administered. This is weird. It's like just, you, you see this correlation, this correlation, and then that. All right, average age of adverse reaction reports by week, it's continuing to go down. Uh, let's see, continue, continue. All right, here we are. Days from reaction to report. It's not gonna be, for example, numerical. It's like zero, one, two, seven. So if more uh, reports are filed on the seventh day as opposed to the third day. So often about a week. So let's say someone gets vaccinated on a Saturday, they may not be able to file a report till next Saturday. Days to reaction. I had that question asked prior, and here we are. Days to reaction. And this is at a, um, I think over 300. So there we are. You can see that right down there. Days to reaction. Uh, let's see, 127, 38, you know, 34, 33. Again, it's not numerical. It's in, it's in the number of reports per that day. All right, now we are going to move fast because this is 52 minutes past the hour. So let's look at the rest real fast, cover world data. All right, here we are. That's uh, new cases moved per million, mortality uh, percentage across the globe. Let's see if I get any information that's new. Remember Sweden uh, and everything else that there's Great Britain the past few days cause for concern. Um, do, 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 do. So again, you know, then they're going to blame it on the variants when it may just be simply not the variants' fault. It could be that their the pandemic mitigation strategy relying solely on vaccinations uh, may not be, you know, may not have been a good a good call. All right, there's that. Uh, this is mortality percentage compared to people fully vaccinated of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And then we go down the line, Asia. Remember India, only 1% was vaccinated. So what's that indicating? That's a little lower. Africa, again, look at the y-axis. Yeah, it looks kind of creepy, but however though, it's the y-axis is still nothing compared to here. 150,000 here, 17,500 here. Again, it looks, uh, it looks um, dire, but however though, the cases are still pretty minor compared to the rest of the world. Uh, Europe, Da 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 da. Look down the line. Again, look at that. Look how what the fast that went up. It went from April to June. Two month cycles. Boom. It's like wow. I got that. That 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 that. Please forgive me. I'm gonna go a little fast. So I sound kind of cryptic. Europe cases per million. I don't know how long can they maintain their emergency powers. Uh, U.S. new cases per million. California here, this, that governor's still a state of emergency powers. Uh, Europe mortality per million, use mortality per million, USA, da da da, da da line, da da line, da 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 da. A world mask. Oxford, update your data. They still have their data uh, at, I think, level. Do, 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 do. Yeah, right here. You see this heat map? Obviously, heat maps are a rough way of correlation. For those that know correlations, you see an 8.7s there, which shows a correlation between face coverings and reduction in hospital patients, ICU patients, so on and so forth. I didn't think so. But this is outdated. Please, uh, our world data, update that information because it's confusing. And then there's the United States. 
drop, 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 drop. Again, the objective was to flatten hospitals uh, or basically to to not be a, a drain on hospital resources. Now the pandemic has taken a turn to something a little different. Sweden, you don't hear about anymore uh, because there's nothing to hear about. It was not the dire disaster that was predicted. I mean, South America, I don't know why, they have, Brazil especially has this going on. Japan looks like they're probably going to have the Olympics. They don't really have, they're going back down to like nothing, um, regardless of cases. New Zealand didn't, didn't join the pandemic. Finland, uh, yeah, pretty low. India just went through again. Uh, we're always low compared to the countries, but somehow the media just grabbed onto it and just made it sound like they were coming to an end. Spain, they did it to all these countries. France, they did it to United Kingdom. Uh, yeah, they're getting more cases, but but if the objective was to to flatten the curve, does that look flat to you? All right. Uh, of course, cases are higher, but that's going to result in your hospitalizations and stuff. Uh, Italy, thank goodness, they're doing really good, it looks like. And then that's it. The population, hospital actually cover we built. Da da. Well, they'll do that, to that, to that, 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 that. And let's just go to our Monte Carlo Markov chain thing. There we are right there, New Death United States. Uh, if we go to predict what we have here in the future, it is now June 27th, about 35 cases per million. At this current rate, if we do these iterations, looks like by December 20th, it'll be a nice Christmas, provided no other weird variant thing pops up. And death per million, the same thing. Um, looks like it's going to start bottoming out pretty much in November. And Monte Carlo was wrong before, but th that was back in last June. So I'm going to withhold any sort of... Um, uh, premonition based upon a machine learning model until we see exactly how it plays out. Especially since last time when we started testing younger individuals, yeah, of course there were more cases because we were testing groups which are less vulnerable and it blew my Monte Carlo machine model out the window. So let's review what we looked at tonight. All right, databases, what is the VAERS, our world and data, outbreak info, news stories, uh, interesting thing in reference to the deep data in reference to the various reports. Uh, herpes zoster, uh, we'll check that out next week because that's new to me. Tapeworm drug, all the links there. We're not interested in tapeworm drug. Uh, for individuals who can't get a hold of it, so per se. But something that's within reach, spermidine. And uh, again, 90% in vitro. 85% reduction in virus particles produce similar results. And wheat germs, soya, mushrooms, mature cheese, if you prefer to get it from food, bon appetit. Uh, shout out, yep, don't let them pretend like they're in the in crowd. They are making tons and tons and tons of money based upon leveraging pandemic and mitigation strategies and PPE and everything else like that. Um, and they increase their wealth by one third. All right, how intentional that was at our expense, that is, that that hypothesis is not for I, that is for you. All right, and then tree pollen, freaky, but now it's some of the good information to know, and that could play a role, obviously, in reference to the utility in social distancing measures. Is that publish your bias? We'll see. All right, long COVID symptoms, real important for individuals which are susceptible to, especially Epstein-Barr. Uh, real important to uh, to obtain with a medical practitioner information. It will be linked for you. I uh, had COVID-19 boosters for all. Kind of sad. Hopefully there's other, other treatments available that don't require emergency use authorization. 90% loss within 85 days. And my favorite, Goulian Bar or Guillaume Bourde. So not Goulian Bar, but Goulian Bar for those which are not as familiar. And for those in the medical profession, Guillain-Barre, all right? And so Guillain-Barre syndrome looks like a potential there. It's nothing really to laugh at. But however, though, when you look at the number of paralysis cases rising in, uh, as far as reactions, uh, there may be some premise to that. So I just want to keep that in mind. 
but let's just keep let's just continue forward with finishing up and then that's it again thank you for listening i have all the links for you as well hope you find this information a use to find information which you can utilize to either help yourself family or friends and until the next week uh, I'll t look into the herpes zoster thing, just a curiosity, or run through the data frame itself. And any information that continues to uh, come up that can be of help, I'll be more than more than happy to present to you. Gratitude, thank you. Gratitude to all the researchers as well. And I am humbled by you actually watching this long. To all of you, good night, and I'll see you next time. See you then. Bye.